So let's try to summarize what we just discussed and try to go a little bit more into details. So if somebody asks you what is the HTTP protocol, the first thing that you should answer is it's a request response protocol. So we have a client, which is just a communication role, just to, com uh, just to, to repeat what we just said. And we have the server. It doesn't need to be a big server-side computer. It's just a communication role. The client sends the request to the server, and the server answers with a response. Both are independent from each other. So the request is sent, the server processes the request, and independent of the request, the response comes back. And exactly what you said, the server is passive until it is asked for data from the client. Good. We summarized that so far. Now, the request can be of different types. You already said that before when I asked you what you know about um, about web requests. You said we have different methods, right? So let's write that down. Here we have the methods. And you already mentioned a bunch of, bunch of methods. Can you repeat them? Uh, post. Post. Let's write it down here. Post. What is post? It's used for uploading data. Uploading data, OK. Let's discuss that quickly. Post means we upload something. When we have a web API that stores something in the database, it is also often referred to as creating records, just like in SQL and SQL, where you have an insert statement. You know why it's called post? That has historical reasons. Historically, in the very old ancient internet times, you had very dumb websites. You could just look at things, and sometimes you had a contact form where you can enter, this is my name, this is my email address, please contact me, I want to buy something from you. This was a form. And at that point in time, these forms were posted, just like a, just like a, a letter is sent via post to somebody else. We say we post the data to the server. So people said, okay, we post something, that means we upload something from the client to the server in order to create something. Got it? Good. So that is the post method. What else? You mentioned multiple of them. Get. Get. Get is kind of obvious, right? The client asks the server, give me some data I would like to read data from. Good. What else? Delete. Delete. Do I need to describe what delete does? Not really. Right? The client says delete something from a database, for instance. What else? Yep. Patch. Patch. What means patch? There most likely is existing data, and I want to modify it. OK, you want to modify data. I like that one. Um, do we have a second method for updating data? Put. put. Very good. So what is the difference between put and patch? Can you remember it? I'm pretty sure you've heard it before. I think with use patch, you just send some of the attributes. Exactly. With the and we put the whole entity. Good. Very good. So these are the methods that you need to remember, at least for this course. Post, get, delete, patch, put. There are additional ones like head and options and so on. We use them primarily with course. We have discussed course already when we did some Angular programming. But for now, these are the important ones. Very good. Very, very nice. Now, what else did we have in the request? We had the uh, headers. Headers. We already discussed the headers. They are metadata. Give me some examples of what headers are. Cookies. We already discussed. Cookies are technically headers. What else? Authorization headers. Authorization header. So what is an authorization header? Uh, we already had it when yeah. we accessed, for instance, uh, Airtable, right? Yeah? We basically send something, a token or a key that yep. tells the server we are allowed to make modifications. Good, very good. So it's a kind of user identification. It gives us authorization over doing what we want to do. Exactly. Anything else? Yeah? Post. Hmm? 
uh, host header. Yeah, exactly. Um, there we specify the host name with who we want to talk to. Yeah, and content length and a lot of other headers. Uh, I already showed you that you can press F12 on your browser and then you see in the network tab all the different headers. We can take a look at them. They are a lot. The service and spec something like also here we have the headers. Then we already discussed the status code. I mean, if you forget what the status codes are, just Google HTTP status cats, and then you will never forget the status codes again. Did I already show you? Google it, try it. Just Google HTTP status cats, and if you are more a dog person, then Google HTTP status dogs, and you will see a lot of funny pictures. Yes? It's a request code, not a, a response code. It's a response code, you're right. Thank you very much, thank you very much. I screwed up. So here we have the status code. Good, thank you. It's a response, not a request. Do you have some examples for status codes? Yeah. 200. 200 is what? Okay. Oh, okay. What else? 400. What is 400? Uh, from the client side, something's wrong. For XX, all the four error messages mean that the client did something wrong. Do you have examples for what the client can do wrong? Um, like it didn't uh, include a authorization header. Yep, forbidden, for instance. Yeah. Or yeah. If you send faulty data. Yeah, bad request would be an uh, example for that. Not found would be an example for that. Exactly. Anything in the 2xx range, 200 is okay, but what else? 204. What is 204? No content, I think. No content. 201, created, for instance. Yep, I think it's called no date. No, it's not. No content. I'm not sure. Yep. Um, good. Yeah, very good. Very good. There are additional ones. The 1xx, the 3xx. What is 5xx? Mm -hmm. Server error. Server error, exactly. The 4xx is the client did something wrong. The 5xx is the server did something wrong. Or something happened on the server side. Exactly. That is the status code. Um, and I think the mo most important status codes, you know them already. And the HTTP status codes, status cats website is really nice. I like it. Okay, do we have anything else? Of course we have something, which is super important. And now I don't make a mistake. Um, we have the body, and there is a request body and a response body. What is the body? Uh -huh. The body is where we send or retrieve our data. Oh, okay, what data? Well, mostly the type of JSON. Or ah, so okay. We have to specify the content we accept as a client. Yes. Send back to the server, and he answers with the specified content type. Good, very good. I like that one. And the payload, we call it payload, the payload of the request or the response is in the body. When the client posts something to the server, we have a payload, a body in the request. When the server sends back something, we have a re response body. The server sends something back to the, to the client. Exactly, the body. Good. Yeah, I like that. Any questions so far? Are we good? Good, very good. So we have a quick summary of what HTTP is really all about. And now comes the important question. Why do we talk about that? Why is HTTP relevant for coding in distributed systems? Why is HTTP relevant for, for building distributed applications? I mean, this was built for websites, right? Yeah. It's used for APIs. APIs. I mean, if I program C-sharp, I can program an API in C-sharp. Why do we need HTTP for that? Uh-huh. HTTP is just a standardized protocol to use. Protocol for what? For this request and response system and the methods yeah. and everything. Yeah, okay. And why do I need that? I mean, can't I just write everything in TypeScript or everything in C-sharp and then I don't need this whole networking, blah, blah, why? I think I don't need it, but uh, it's helpful. For so which kind of applications? Uh-huh. 
which require a network connection. A network connection? And why do I need a network connection? I mean, let's put everything on a client computer. I can install all my stuff here on my computer. Why? Because then everyone would have to install everything on their computer. If yeah. They want to use that. Like we would have to install YouTube on our own computer, and we don't even have enough uh, capacity to save all the videos that would be there. Okay, so so what HTTP really enables is a kind of software as a service. We can build large server farms, as we discussed it, and these server farms, they offer digital products for us, like streaming video, listening to music, storing documents, something like this, and they make these services available through HTTP. Because HTTP is such a widespread protocol. I mean, we are here in Austria and we speak English. Why do we do that? Because there are so many people out there who speak English. So knowing English enables us to communicate with a lot of people. And the same is true for HTTP. HTTP is so old and so widely used that if we speak HTTP, nearly everyone on this planet can talk to us. If we invent our own protocol, nobody knows about this protocol and nobody can speak to us. And probably nobody will care about our protocol, they will simply ignore us. By using HTTP, we have a protocol that everybody understands, from the tiniest microcontroller to the largest data center server. They all speak HTTP. So, let's use HTTP to make our services widely available. So using HTTP, don't get, don't get this wrong here. Using HTTP does not mean that we use the best protocol for the job. HTTP was never designed to do things that it has to do today. HTTP is successful because it is there. And everybody speaks HTTP. So we have a standard, everybody understands it, and this is the cause, the reason for the success of HTTP. In reality, there would be much better protocols for letting computers talk to each other, but they are not as widespread as HTTP. Therefore, we have to live with it. And there are a lot of crazy things going on in HTTP, which we really, really dislike, typically as programmers, but we have to live with it. Does HTTP have any competitors? Protocols that you have heard about, where you would say, well, in the future, we are not going to use HTTP anymore, but we are going to use XYZ. <coughs> XYZ. What about WebSockets? Ever heard about WebSockets? You know what? WebSockets is a super cool protocol. And what do you think? Where is WebSockets based on? HTTP. WebSockets is an extension. Web, WebSockets is initiated using HTTP, so it is closely connected to HTTP. What about gRPC? <coughs> Have you ever heard about gRPC? No? Google RPC. Great standard for super efficient communication between servers, for instance. Guess what? It's built on top of HTTP. What about GraphQL? Have you ever heard about GraphQL? Maybe? a very prominent um, um, API standard built uh, or invented primarily at Facebook, nowadays a very open protocol. Guess what? It's built on HTTP. What about OData? SAP is using OData a lot. Microsoft is using OData a lot. Guess what? I think you know what I'm going to say, right? It's based on HTTP. So HTTP is just, just there. It's the workhorse of the internet. And therefore, if we have to, if we build distributed systems nowadays, we have to understand HTTP. There are different versions of HTTP out there. The original, oldest version that is widely used on the internet, do you know the version number? 1.1. HTTP 2 is also pretty widely used. And HTTP 3, it's rather early for that. But HTTP 1.1 is still widely used. HTTP 2 is, is also quite widely used. New versions will come up probably in the future. Good. Do you have any further questions regarding this HTTP stuff? This is definitely something that you have to remember and understand. 
in order to be successful for the upcoming weeks when we program this stuff. Because in the upcoming weeks, we are going to use C Sharp for implementing exactly that. This is what we are going to focus on. We are going to write server applications using C Sharp and a platform which is called ASP.NET Core. This is what we are going to implement. Okay. So far, we have already have always used ready-made services like Airtable and other services. We have used OpenAI web services, but now we are going to build our own services so that we can build our own digital products in the cloud. Good? Okay, so let's close this one and talk about these things. We, we just said we are going to use C Sharp and the platform is called ASP.NET Core. What would be alternatives? We have no, um, no options here in this course because this school decided to go for ASP.NET Core in the fourth grade, in your grade. But if we wouldn't be in this school, or if this school would look like would look for alternatives, what would be alternatives? Yeah. Uh, Spring Boot. Issues. Spring Boot. That would be Java, right? Yes. Okay. And I'm not going to write anything here because I have no idea about Java. Yes, Spring Boot. And I think there is something like Quarkus or something. I've never worked with it. I have no idea. But yes, you're right. Definitely, Java would be an option. What else? Go. Go, go would be an option. Um, go is a programming language from Google. Um, it's very widely used when it comes to distributed system and server-side programming. It's a very simple programming language. It's con consciously built in a very, very simple way. It's super fast. Docker is built with Go. Kubernetes is built with Go. And many other widely used platforms are built with Go. Do we need a framework like ASP.NET Core or Spring Boot for Go? Do you know that? No. no. No means you don't know it, or no, you don't need a framework. I'll go with, how, with whichever one's correct. <laughs> okay, I see. Uh, you don't really need a framework. That's one of the very important aspects of Go. Go has a super strong standard library. So whatever you need to build simple to medium complex web applications is built into the platform. You can add some packages if you need them, and there are also very powerful frameworks, like, for instance, a framework which is called G, yeah, like the drink. Um, and you can use them, but you don't absolutely need them. Good, very good. Go. What else? Yeah. Maybe Python plus. Python, yeah, of course. Python. And the framework would be Flask. Exactly. And as an Austrian, you have to use Python Flask. It was invented by an Austrian. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that would be an option. Definitely. What else? Rust. Rust. Okay. Rust. Do we need a framework in Rust? Rocket. Rocket, for instance. Yes. Rocket or Axon or Actix. Uh, let's say Rocket in, uh, in in brackets here because it's it's not so much on the rising area. Axon would be the currently widely used uh, platform here. Yes, Rust. And something is missing. What else? Angular CLI? No. <laughs> but you are getting close. No, Angular CLI is not a server-side programming framework. Huh? Node.js. Oh, yeah. JavaScript with Node.js. And do you know the name of a framework for Node? One of the most widely used frameworks is Express. The Express framework can be used with JavaScript, can be used with TypeScript, works very well. That's also another option. Do you have additional options? Yes, a lot of additional options. You can write your apps in, in F Sharp, you can use PHP, you can use Ruby on Rails, you can use a lot of stuff. Yeah, people still use PHP, believe it or not. And they are successful with it. So you see, a lot of options, and this is the option that we are going to work with. Now, ASP.NET Core 
is also rather old. ASP.NET Core, let's quickly finish that and then we do a break, okay? ASP.NET Core had a um, predecessor that was ASP.NET. And before ASP.NET, we had ASP. That was horrible. ASP was worse than PHP. ASP.NET was okay. Then came ASP.NET Core. And what we are going to do is ASP.NET Core, but not just ASP.NET Core, but we are going to do the ASP.NET Core minimal API. ASP.NET Core minimal API. Congratulations, you are the first class where I will teach minimal API. Minimal API is rather new. It has been invented only a few years ago by Microsoft, and it <coughs> has grown stronger and stronger and stronger over the last uh, few versions. And I think now it's really ready that we, that we can build on top of it. And I am pretty sure that you will like it. Before the minimal API, if you created a C-sharp ASP.NET Core API, you had to have at least, I don't know, three or four or five different files in different folders, and they had to have different names, and you had to have classes and whatever. And now with minimal API, the Hello World API consists of, I think, five lines of code. And this is nice, right? But this does not mean that you cannot build really complicated and powerful applications on top of it. Absolutely not. The beauty of the minimal API in ASP.NET Core is that you can start really, really small and simple, and you can grow over time. And I really like that. I think, I personally think, this is in C Sharp, the future for API development, until something new comes along, of course. Good. So this is what we are going to do. Very good. And now we have a quick break, and then we do a Hello World app in ASP.NET Core Minimal API. Very good. I'm going to check whether the recording worked.